Now's the time to run it. Please welcome to the stage Yarko Yakola and Appa Tuli. All right. There. Morning. So, my name is Apartuli. I'm here with Yarko. And we wanted to talk about the future of mobility, like everyone else here is talking about as well. But before we get into the future, I think it's good to start from the past. Because the past teaches us a lot about change. What we've taken for granted hasn't always been so. Take our city streets as an example. This is Manhattan about 100 years ago. Our streets weren't always designed for transport. They weren't just conduits for transport. Our streets were more like parks. They were these social spaces where people used to meet, where kids used to play, where interaction used to happen, where vendors used to sell. So the streets served a very different purpose. Now, back in these days, there were some interesting professions. They don't exist anymore. Professions like the crossing sweepers. Now, crossing sweepers were generally these young boys whose job was to clean the street when wealthy people were trying to cross the street. And in return for doing this, they would get some tips. That's how they used to make a living, by earning money from wealthy people who were trying to cross the street. Now, what is it that they were cleaning? It was horseshit. Because our city streets were covered in horseshit. In fact, on any given day in a big city like London or New York, streets used to look like this. Almost 15 kilos of horse manure and one liter of urine just deposited on the streets. The situation got so bad that an article was published in the Times saying that by 1950, every street in London would be buried under three meters of horse manure. Now, this was termed as the great horse manure crisis because it doesn't seem like a great picture. But of course, our city streets weren't covered in three meters of horse manure. What changed? Did this product solve the problem? Now, what's there not to like about it? It runs on hydrocarbons. There are no odors, no vibrations, 20 miles an hour. It seems like an excellent product for the problem we were facing. Now, cars slowly started appearing on our city streets, and they changed the urban landscape. They took care of the horse manure crisis. And as you can see, our city streets started to change. People, cars, Buses, trolleys, all intermingling with each other. This is not how people interact with streets nowadays. You can't really walk like that when there's traffic on the street. But then, the car, it brought the personal freedom of mobility to everyone. But whenever I look at pictures like this, I wonder, does our morning commute ever look like this? Because for most of us, this is what a commute looks like. I would say that what we thought was a solution actually ended up becoming a new problem. So we designed the car as an amazing product, but we never thought how it would scale to a system, and would that be a sustainable solution. But pictures and words still don't do justice. This sketch explains the problem we are dealing with. We have sacrificed over 80% of our street space to transport and its related infrastructure. Every year, 1.2 million people die in traffic-related accidents. Think about that. Every 30 seconds, one human is dying. What led to this? It started with this object the shoe. It gave us access to distances that our human body could handle. This was soon augmented by this object. This is a buggy whip. This is what we used to control horses for almost two centuries. So this was the predominant form of controlling our mobility. 
But then, what came in the last century? That's what's made the biggest difference to how we move about. And it's not so much about what this object represents. It's about the system that's behind this object, which is the system of ownership of mobility, personal ownership of mobility. Anybody who needs to get somewhere needs to own one of these. And when everyone has one of these, the situation starts looking like this. It's not sustainable. I think we all understand that and we see that happening around us. I would say that at this stage, we are dealing with yet another horse manure crisis. And this is one of those crises which we can't solve by cars once again, unlike the last crisis. Because a problem that's created by personal ownership of cars can't be solved by adding more of those. Not even the fancy self-driving electric cars that we're all waiting for. I think we need to understand how all these different modes of transport work with each other. It's not about designing a better car. It's about designing a better city, which works for everyone, not just for those who are with one particular mode of transport. Because if we don't do that, the future doesn't look very bright. In 2050, when almost two out of three humans would be living in an urban settlement, this is what the future would look like. There would be, oh, some text is missing apparently, there would be about 2.2 billion cars and a lot of pollution. I think we understand that. But the other scenario that we are looking forward to, the self-driving car scenario, doesn't look much better. Even though electrification helps us solve the pollution problem to a large extent, the congestion of a city doesn't go away unless we change the underlying system which governs how transport in a city exists. And that's why we are looking at a different solution, which is the shared and multimodal scenario. Because in this, not only do we cut down on the pollution, but we also drastically reduce the congestion facing our cities. Cities understand this problem pretty well. It's pretty clear the amount of street space it takes to move a group of people from one end of the street to the other. And if a city is not designed for multimodality, it's not going to be sustainable because certain modes of transport are a lot better than some other modes of transport in moving people across. Take a look at the ownership of a private car. It's quite expensive. These numbers are for Finland, but it's not very different for different parts of the world, relatively speaking. And mobility is the second largest expense in a family. After you've taken housing out, it's mobility. And 85% of that actually goes to private ownership of cars. And yet, I'll go back. And yet, it is something that is used so little. There's so much inefficiency involved in producing a car, maintaining a car, and getting rid of a car, and yet it's used 4% of its lifetime. And I think as a designer, this pains me a lot. This hasn't been designed as a well-working efficient system. Because this is what it looks like. That 5% use is spread over a month like this, and it still doesn't cover all my needs because I have so many other needs which a car can't cover. Sometimes it's good weather when I want to cycle. Sometimes the car is broken, I need to take a taxi. Sometimes I'm drunk, I have to take a bus. If I'm ill, I might need to go with someone else to my work. So even though we put so much money into this one mode of transport, it doesn't take care of all our different needs during that month. Well, it's doing something weird. <laughs> so. We need all these different modes of transport to go through our month, and we put all our money into just one. That's the problem that we are trying to solve. And what would the solution be? If there are all these different things which have taken us step by step to larger and bigger economic and mobility range, what comes next? To me, it's this. This is a skeleton key, a master key which was used to open multiple doors. 
And mobility as a service is a way to think of it as a skeleton key. It's this key which unlocks all the mobility that my city has to offer. Because in the end, it's not about all those different modes of transport. It's not that I need a cycle or a car or a taxi. I need to get somewhere. It's not about the transport, but rather having access to mobility, moving to another place. That's what we did when we launched WIM in Helsinki a couple of years ago. We combined all these different modes that were available and put them into a monthly subscription. We wanted to provide a compelling alternative to car ownership. We've been called the Netflix of transportation, although we are not about binge traveling. We don't actually encourage that at all. But we want people to see that there are compelling alternatives, which is what Mars is about. Mars is about intermodality, that not every trip needs to be done with just one mode of transport. You can combine different modes to do one journey. It's also about modal shifting, or the idea that people could move to more sustainable modes of transport if they feel that it's as convenient. Mars is also about active modes, or the idea of walking and cycling being an integral part of the transport infrastructure, not just a weekend hobby that you do every now and then to pass time. And all these go together to support public policy goals. Goals related to sustainability, carbon emission targets, health of citizens, equality in a city. Our application might look like another route planner, but there's one key difference. You can actually perform the whole trip from start to go because we issue the tickets, accounting, payment, everything is managed through the interface. And you don't have to pay for each trip because you are a subscriber of the service. And of course, we are multimodal because we support things like taxis, city bikes. Sorry, something's weird. <laughs> taxis, city bikes, as well as cars. So depending on your need, on any given moment, you can decide what is the best way to travel instead of being stuck to one particular mode of transport. When we designed the service, we, as designers, would work with the users of the service, who in this case were inhabitants of Helsinki region. We were targeting users who already own cars and wanting to get rid of them, and people who don't own a car but are planning to get one. We wanted to understand what are their needs, what would they need from a service like this. And one thing which comes very clearly is that mobility needs are highly contextual and they are very, very context specific. Depending on your life stage, you would have different mobility needs. Even depending on the day, you would have different mobility needs. Or even depending on the hour, you would have different mobility needs. And how do you design a service which takes care of all these? One way to do that is to look at it from a user's perspective, which is what designers work on. We've developed the language of mobility where we try to understand the interactions we as people do when it comes to using transport in a city. These cards help us understand and develop empathy for end users, people who use mobility, people who travel. That's basically all of us. And as we develop the service and move to new cities, this language expands. We have used this in various workshops, not just with our end users, but also with transport operators, so that we can all develop a common understanding of how people travel through a city and what are the issues they face. We create user journeys and we try to understand how would people move from one mode of transport to another. But still, it's good to remember that technology and design aren't always the answer. We think that technology will solve all the problems of a city, but let's remember that city is a spatial problem, it's a political problem, it's a legislative problem. And just saying that we have great technology won't magically fix all of it. These are only little tiny steps that we are making towards this sustainable future. Take one example. If we were to encourage people to travel in a certain way, how should we do that as designers? Now the right answer, of course, is it depends 
on what my needs are at one particular moment. Depending on that, I will choose one of these. But if we encourage everyone to do the one on top, make it the most convenient, everybody would like to travel like that, that future looks like this. And this is a future, personally, I'm not very, very keen on living in or designing for. We need to balance the individual wants that we have versus the needs of humanity, how an urban society functions. Because if we can't do that, the city doesn't work for anyone at all. It's not just the car owners or the cycle owners or the bus owner or the bus riders. Now, that's a big ask. Because if you think about this, it's very hard to compete with the option above. It's just so convenient. But we need to design these little spots in between. Because these are the things which people deal with day after day when they have to choose multimodality over a car. All these unconscious thoughts that go through people's minds. And we have collected this through user research. We've been visiting different spots where people actually make these changes between different modes of transport, trying to understand their needs. How do they actually travel? And what are the different concerns they might have? And then we design for that, trying to solve each of those pain points one by one, hoping that eventually people would see mobility as a service as a compelling alternative to owning a car. This is real data from our service, over a million trips. And you can see how the city lives and breathes. It wakes up and goes to sleep day after day. And we've had great success. We've had about 5 million trips already through our service. And we've been expanding beyond Helsinki to other markets as well. And to talk more about that, here's Yarko. Thank you. I think Apara has been doing a remarkable job with the business of uh, actually designing our services. Uh, I don't know how many awards we have already won. So in that sense, it looks very good. And also from the customer feedback that we're receiving is actually very good. But in order to actually, well, it already came up, so there's no surprise. I'm about to talk about a little bit of how to make mass possible. I know actually we are the, it's actually going forward in, by itself. Let's start here. Sorry for that. Uh, so how do we actually, or city, or municipality, or government can enable mass? Uh, I think we all can agree that if you have a car sitting on your front yard, you're more keen on using it every single time than when you go somewhere. And that's the problem that we're facing, and that's the problem that Apar is with the, with the design is trying to change. Just uh, if the car is not there, then you're more keen on trying different uh, modes of transportation. And that's the key point. So how do we enable mobility as a service in a city or in a country? That's a problem that we are facing in different cities and governments, or sorry, countries where we are going. Today we are already present in Helsinki, uh, Birmingham, Antwerp, and we just launched Vienna. Uh, this was it yesterday? So we are expanding. In order to make mobility as a service possible in, uh, in a uh, city, uh, first thing to understand is who is it for? It is meant for the consumers. So we have to keep that in mind. Uh, the best way to approach, there are a couple of ways how this uh, mobility as a service business can evolve in a different uh, in a city or uh, a country. So first one is that every provider would have their own siloed own ecosystem or in that case, I wouldn't call it even an ecosystem. I would call it just a business proposal from one company. And now it's starting to move forward again. Let's see if it stops here. Uh, in that sense, uh, there's a big problem that I can see with this approach, is that if every single mo mobility transport provider would have only one partner to speak with or to do business with, then the total offering for the end user would never be the best. Because one of them would have uh, a certain transport provider like taxi company, which would be the best one, sorry. Uh, that means that the other couldn't get access to it. And it could be the most vital part of uh, transportation within that city. But if it's only working with one partner and the rest of the services that they provide is, isn't really good, 
then the consumers don't accept it. That's really a big problem if we are work, going to work in a siloed approach. Then the uh, approach will never be the best. Second one is the winner takes it all. Of course, the first model can evolve into the winner takes it all approach. Once again, it would probably not be the best one for the consumers because then uh, they're taking about of their own profits, not the, what's best for the consumers. Third one is public transportation takes it all, meaning that the public transportation would cover and show uh, of, well, basically a public transportation would start offering their mass or mobility as a service. Uh, the problem that I see over here is that basically a twofold problem. One is that, uh, of course, then usually a subsidized player would enter the competitive market, which pre presents uh, significant problems. And the other one is that I'm a bit hesitant to understand if the public transportation would be uh, the most, uh, let's say, innovative one to provide these kind of answers and best mobility options for the end user. I'd say that companies can be a little bit braver on approaching new innovative ideas towards the consumers than the public transportation. What we are talking about always and trying to enforce people to understand is the open ecosystem uh, where all, all of the transport providers would partner with all of the mobility providers or mobility as a service providers. That means that uh, one taxi company can have multiple partners on the mobility as a service uh, operators. That also means that you're not, uh, from the mobility transport provider point of view, you're not going to put all your eggs in one basket. You are not actually making the choice that, okay, this guy is going to win or this company is going to win it, if you are actually partnering with all of them. Uh, we have been offered a number of exclusive deals ourselves, and we have turned all of them down because we believe in the open ecosystem, and that's uh, what the consumers need. If they get what is best for them, that's how this mobility as a service ecosystem and approach can evolve so that it will be a big hit and the sustainability part can also take into effect. When we are actually going forward, uh, it is to, uh, I've seen a couple of reports uh, evaluating the amount of business that this mobility as a service can uh, generate in the next couple of years. Uh, the projections range from $1 trillion to $4 trillion already 2025. That's a hell of a lot of money, if, you may, if I may say so. The, what we are actually doing about is the local ecosystem parts. Uh, every single city could have their own ecosystems, meaning all the players can work or even compete in the same area. That also creates a lot of benefits for the local partners, uh, meaning that uh, for example, if uh, a small player would like to join the ecosystem, there would already be existing users. Meaning that the marketing costs and uh, acquiring customers would be relatively cheap for that uh, relatively new par uh, mobility partner. Uh, also, they could expand with a mobility as a service provider to another city where they already have a customers. So they would already enter a market where customers already exist. So that would be an added benefit as well. The other one is with the global roaming network. So with one app, you could then uh, travel wherever you are. When you are enter going home from here, if it's in Paris, Stockholm, New York, wherever, imagine the convenience that you're actually going to get when you look, open the same app and then you go and check what would be the price from here to, or how do I get from here to the airport via public transportation, via taxi, you will know all of this in advance before you actually make the de uh, decision that which mode of transportation are you going to use. And of course, we can add some information on the CO2 emissions so you can actually make a more sustainable uh, choice. And we can even nudge you towards making a sustainable choice. And also, when you're going to another city, when you are in Paris airport, for example, you have no idea how to get to the place you're going, to a meeting or conference. You just open up the same app and it will always show you the way you can actually get there using public transportation, perhaps even a taxi at some point if you're in a hurry. Because all the modes, all the selections that we make can be based on a couple of uh, uh, reasons. One is, of course, time. Other is cost. Third is emission. 
But if you are educated enough of those, uh, what the result is of that choice, then you can actually start making uh, wise choices towards the sustainable, if you have time. I know we are all business approach minded uh, people over here, so usually we tend to take taxi a bit too often, I'd say. But if you can actually open up the same app and say, okay, with the taxi it will cost me like 20 euros and take 12 minutes. But if I find out that actually the public transportation would only take me one minute more, and it would actually cost me a fifth of that price, which one would you choose? I would hope that you would actually choose, choose uh, the public transportation or even walking or some micro-mobility op option. But if you are unaware of that choice in a, a city that you don't know, you're probably going to end up taking a taxi, which is bad for the uh, city and in the environment. It could be good for that taxi entrepreneur, but that's another topic. The reason why we're actually uh, doing this about the scaling part and of the why all of those projections of businesses look so big is that the services are already there. We don't have to uh, manufacture new buses, new taxis, new cars. They're already there. Our goal is actually just to connect all of those into one single app and then uh, you can travel wherever you are like a local person. That's the whole point of it. And that's when you can actually start to change the way you're thinking. And this is the major question that we're trying to find an answer, which APAR is also trying to find an answer to. What would it take for you to give up your car? Why is this always going forward? Uh, the answer to this is, of course, a problematic because to each and every single one of you, the answer is different. It might be different for me, it might be different for you, you or you. So we would actually have to develop a service that would cover majority of your uh, needs and they're all different. Like Mapar told, it is contextual, it is time, uh, it is cost related. There's a lot of different things that we have to take into account. So it's not going to be easy, but we're definitely trying to do it. Trying to find a way for a sustainable mobility. Let's see how it goes. Fingers crossed. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.